Hello, my name is Jerome Rose and I'm founder and director of the International Keyboard Institute and Festival. I'm delighted to present to you Winoa Yinu Wang, wonderful pianist from China. Her presentation of the Schumann First Sonata, the first sonata in F-sharp minor, which is so exciting. I think you'll find it absolutely wonderful. Her marvelous command of English, her explanation, it's actually world class. And she is one, really one of the finest pianists from China today. She is part of this festival. She attended it. She won the competition. And we are excited to bring her to you in this video presentation. I also want to thank Dean Richard Kessler, the College of Performing Arts, Associate Dean Jessica Cochran, and also our Chair of the Piano Department at the Manus School of Music, Pavlina Dukovska. I think you'll find this performance absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, thank you for watching. My name is Wainona Wang, and I'm also known as Yinuo, that's my Chinese name. Um, feel free to follow me on Instagram or Facebook page, that's also my name, or visit my personal website, wainonapiano.com. I'm very happy to join this year's International Keyboard Institute and Festival, the special online edition. And I'd like to thank Mr. Jerm Rose for inviting me. And I'd also like to thank Ms. Pavlina Dokovka and also um, Mana School for arranging the venue and making it happen. Also, I'd like to thank Mr. Asaf Blasberg, our videographer, for his hard work. I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to share some music and thoughts with you on this special online edition of IKIF this year. And today, I'd like to spend some time on Sch uh, Schumann Sonata No. 1 in F sharp minor, opus 11. Robert Schumann composed this sonata around the years of 1833 to 1835. As we know that in many of Schumann's work, the emotional feelings and narratives in his music relate directly to his own life. So what was happening at the time? Well, many of us already know that um, Robert Schumann and Clara Wieck, later became Clara Schumann, had a, a lifelong relationship and they got married. But back to the time when he composed this sonata, Clara and Robert were not allowed to meet. Well, at that time, Robert was about 24 years old, and Clara was only 15 years old, and she's nine years on, younger than him. But she's already a very well-known concert pianist as a child prodigy, and also she has a very mature heart. And her father, Friedrich Wieck, who was also Robert's teacher, wanted to end their relationship because there was such a bright future in front of Clara. Therefore, he sent Clara away, and Robert and Clara were not able to meet with each other. So Robert used this sonata as a secret communication to show Clara his love and passion for her. He published this sonata as Pianoforte Sonata dedicated to Clara by Floristin and Eusebius. Well, you probably realize that his name is not included in the title because he published it anonymously to avoid Clara's father. And Floristin and Eusebius are two imaginary characters in many of Schumann's writing and music. And the Floristin is more like an extroverted side of him, whereas the um, Eusebius is the introverted side of him. And both of the characters represent Schumann. Later, we'll talk about um, the details in the composition where Schumann put his secret message to Clara and also um, the evidence of Floristin and Eusebius. And Clara, after she, she received the sonata, um, she played this concert, uh, she played this sonata in a lot of concerts and also she played it to Chopin. And I'm sure that when she read through it, she realized that this is a secret code to her. And I think it's so romantic in a way. Um, and now let's talk about each movement briefly. The first movement is in F sharp minor. 
and absolutely it's in sonata form with an introduction. And in the classical period, most composers such as Mozart or Haydn, they would like to compose the sonatas in major mode. But well, as to Beethoven, he as a revolutionary composer, he started his first sonata in F minor, but then in Schumann's um, time, like Romantic period, composers tend to compose the sonata, large scale sonata in minor mode. For example, Schumann had all three of his sonatas in minor mode. The first one is in F sharp minor, the second one is in G minor, and the third one is in F minor. And as well as Chopin, all in minor. Brahms, the first one was in major and then the others are in minors. And then um, Lust, definitely in B minor, and later in Rachmaninoff, all in minor, D minor, and B flat minor. And so this sonata, it begins with a long introduction. And it sounds like an independent piece to me. Um, when we see earlier sonatas, like Beethoven, he also likes to write introductions to his sonata, but they don't stand out as themselves as like an independent piece. For example, if we take um, Les Adieux, Opus 81A, like in the introduction, it starts like this. And in the end of the introduction, it sounds like... See, it goes directly to the main body of the sonata. But in this Schumann sonata, the end of the introduction, it's... That makes it sound like an independent piece. And also another reason why it makes more like an independent introduction is because itself, it's a ternary form with ABA, and it starts in F sharp minor with the tonic pedal and the bass. part sounds like the Floriston character because, well, it's more extroverted and then also it's an extra minor that refers to the F in Floriston. And then the middle section, the B section, uh, is in A major. We'll hear that later in the second movement as well. But this is, I think it refers to Eusebius and also like the right hand start with an E. That is the E in Eusebius. And overall, the feeling of the introduction part is like grand, lyrical, and passionate. Then we enter the exposition. Schumann is really good at combining and weaving motifs and elements. There's a galloping rhythm, like ta -ta 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 all the way through this actually like this whole movement. And then also he has his own fantango motive from his earlier unpublished work. Sounds like this. And then also a quotation from Clara's early work. Well, Clara's work sounds like this. With a very dissonant tritone. But Schumann changed it to, um, to a perfect fifth. But with the same rhythmic pattern. And um, some scholars, they think that um, the perfect fifth represent Clara. And I think it makes sense because like here, he changed it to the perfect fifth. And um, well, I mean, he also quote the um, tritone in Clara's work in other different ways, and then I'll talk about that later. Um, so, well, with all the messages that he includes in this, I would imagine that he's riding on a horse, 
and chasing after Clara because he really wanted to meet her. Um, well, I would say the formal structure of this exposition is as a three key exposition. Well, the first group is in, is in F sharp minor. Well, it starts from the top dominant and then it's a very clear F sharp minor. And then the second group is in E flat minor with a very stable 16 bar period with the um, half cadence in the middle. And then there's a transition part to the third group, which is in A major. And finally, he gives up the galloping, da, 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 the galloping rhythm to a very soothing and lyrical and personal and imaginative um, theme. <laughs> beautiful third group. And then after this part, um, we enter the development and itself it's like a ternary ABA form. And there's a short revisit of the ex um, introduction material in F, in F minor in the end of the B section. very short and then he repeat the same material again but in another key well transposition and then I would just like to mention a little bit of the end of the um, development part which is a triple forte huge triumph moment in F sharp major <laughs> built up to this big arrival, there was like a whole page of building up to this moment. And it's like the arrival of this whole movement. And I'm sure like when people listen to it, they all want to clap. But, well, that's why the Schumann is twisting his listener's expectation because this is a false arrival. And then right after it, <laughs> enters this very, very, very um, moody <laughs> moment right after it. So like in my imagination, he's like, he's going through this long journey and finally he got to the, po he got to the point that he's finally got to meet Clara, but then suddenly he realized that, oh, it was a dream and he can't meet her. Um, it's a very, very, <laughs> special moment in this movement. And then, well, I mean, like after this moment, the recapitulation starts. And then this time, desperately, he stays in F sharp minor all the way to the end. And in the end, he had this repetition between tonic and dominant, but listen, in the dominant chord, it sounds very hollow and empty because there's no third. Like with the third, it will sound like a major triad, but like if there's no third, it's just empty. So he leaves the listener in the very, very dark feeling. And in the end, he He quotes Clara again.
And then we enter the second movement. In A major. Almost like a dream. And well, this movement is marked as aria, senza passione, ma espressivo <laughs> means like there's no passion, but it's very um, expressive. Is that the English word? <laughs> um, the main melody comes from a song that he wrote several years earlier called To Anna. And the song is in F major, but well, in this movement, it's in A major. Um, the poem of the psalm tells the story about the love between Andreas and Anna. And particularly in this one, Andreas is dying on battlefield and he's thinking of Anna. So I think part of the reason perhaps Schumann picked this because he wanted Clara to know that like he would think of her even to his death. Or he picked it because he composed it several years earlier so that Clara was still with him, like, as a kid, I mean. <laughs> but um, he, Clara was not sent away yet. So, like, when she plays it, she would be familiar and she would recognize the melody. But anyways, um, wait, um, we already hear this melody before in the B section of the introduction of the first movement. But this time in the second movement, it sounds much more. Like almost unreal and it's so fragile. And then also like it's so subtle and intimate. Um, well, the song is written for a single voice, but well in this one, apparently in the B section, well, it's a ternary form. And then in the B section, he's introducing another voice to it. And well, to me, I think it sounds like a duet, a love duet. So like the B section. We have the other melody in the low register. Um, well, in this movement, we could also find the intervals of fifth that represents Clara. For example, like here, that's the Clara interval. And later on, the quotation of tritone, that's from Clara's earlier work. Well, that's why I think Schumann is so good at weaving the motifs and elements. It's like composing literature in the language of music. Oh, I forgot to mention that in the first movement, um, in the exposition, the tonal key area, actually the root of them, the first one is, is in F sharp minor, and then the second group is in E flat minor, and then the third group is in A major. So the roots themselves form a diminished triad. But more strikingly, the uh, interval between the second and third group is a tritone that I think like he's using a hidden way to quote Clara. But like here he's doing like, Well, I, it just reminds me when I when I was talking about um, the uh, tritone in the second movement. But yeah, um, let's go on to the third movement. Um, that's a scherzo with intermezzo. He's marking as allegris, allegrissimo. Um, it's such a typical Schumann marking. And to me, it's a quite joyful movement and I always have fun to, uh, to play it. Well, in the intermezzo section, he marked alla burla. Ma pomposo, like a joke. And yeah, I, I indeed feel that when I play it. 
and then he used a recitative to transition back to the skirt. So um, we'll listen to the performance later, but um, since we don't have much time left, I would like to move on to the last movement, the finale. And to me, it's more like a fantasy rather than a well-formed, you know, like a, a traditional sonata form or like a rondo form. And it has a very special visual quality or at least narrative quality in it. And because of the fantasy aspect, the challenge of this movement is to put things together and make it fit to the large scale structure. The beginning is a grand opening in F sharp minor. But apparently he changes harmony rapidly. Like he introduced a new chord in every beat. And then um, this section ends in A major. Um, and there's a long pause. He enters an extremely different scene at this point in A minor. And the transition, this is a transition to the next section, which is in E flat major. This is such a Eusebius movement, because like before, that's definitely the Florestan moment. But here, it brings me a smile when I play it. And then that's definitely the Eusebius uh, moment. And then the key relation, again, between those two parts, it's A major and then E flat major. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, A major and E flat major or A minor. Um, so another tritone that's like quoting from Clara. Um, well, um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time to talk about the build up to the peak, the climax. So after the very lyrical slow session with a little bit of the uh, contrapuntal quality in it, um, he enters this huge build up um, with a actually very small, a very slow harmonic rhythm. Here, and actually he stands on the dominant for almost three lines. And on the right hand, he went back to the galloping rhythm in the first movement, like ta 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 like similar things, but like the harmonic rhythm is so slow with the flowing right hand. And then he stands on the dominant for such a long time and such a beautiful moment, you'll hear it later. And then, um, um, starts to spin the wheel faster and faster by speeding up the harmonic rhythm. So here, we change harmony every beat. And then like the whole register is from the bottom to the up. So like later when we enter, the chorus, it doesn't sound abrupt. It's just so natural because like it's already like spinning to that moment. And then this is like a whole climax moment. I'm not gonna talk about it right now because you'll hear it later. But then like after the huge climax, he immediately dropped to another moment. It's so special and I think it like it represents the Eusebius moment. So like this movement is like switching in between the uh, Floristan character and the Eusebius character. And then after this, like he started from the bottom, like literally the lowest point on the piano. And then with the dissonant chord. Like climbing up back to the... material uh, material again 
And this whole thing repeated again in the second part of this um, movement. And then in the end, um, there is a coda in this big finale that ends in F sharp major. Finally, like he succeeded landing on the F sharp major moment after the uh, false arrival in the first movement in F sharp major. Um, so you'll hear it later. And overall, this sonata is not only a physically challenging sonata, but also interpretively. It is not written in a conventional way. So it requires a lot of imagination, analysis, and understanding of the composer himself and his life. Um, now, finally, I'd like to perform this whole sonata for you. And thank you very much for watching, and I, ho I hope you enjoy this video.
Thank you.